Howdy, Free Speech Zone time again. I'm Bill Olson. Now, uh, I, oh, first of all, I got to say, I'm not affiliated with the Rose Festival. This was a shirt that we were issued when we did the, uh, when we helped with the Junior Rose Festival Parade television show from Cable Access here. I guess we got too good at it uh, because KPTV took it over. I guess you can make a lot more money than we did since we were <laughs> commercial free. But anyway, onward and upward. Uh, we're going to start out today's show with the um, Jesse Ventura clip talking about Chelsea Manning. You know, Chelsea Manning's in jail with a sentence of 35 years. And the people who did the torture that he revealed are out free and getting promoted. Going to have a real nice retirement with more money than you and I ever made in our lifetimes as their ordinary retirement. Well, anyway, let's play that clip and I'll be back. Time for another segment of What Would Jesse Ventura Do? Brigida, take it away. You're going to tell me what I'd do? Former U.S. Army Intelligence Specialist Private Chelsea Manning is asking for help to raise legal funds to appeal the harsh 35-year prison sentence she received in 2013 for blowing the whistle on the American government. Private Manning, a transgender woman formerly in the Army as Bradley Manning, released hundreds of thousands of classified military documents to WikiLeaks in 2010 that revealed the human cost of war. From ChelseaManning.org, here are three of the most important facts she revealed to the public. Private Manning released to WikiLeaks the Iraq and Afghanistan war logs, which showed the official tally of civilian deaths in Iraq and Afghanistan. The Bush and Obama administrations had previously claimed this type of information never existed. But thanks to Chelsea, we now know that isn't true. The logs showed that between 2004 and 2009, the U.S. government counted a total of 109,000 deaths in Iraq. 66,081 of those were classified as non-combatant civilians. This means that for every Iraqi combatant killed, two innocent men, women, or children unnecessarily lost their lives as well. Well, I'm not surprised because uh, Brigida in all wars, I, I don't care what war it is, the civilian death toll is always higher than the military death toll. What does surprise me though is how the Bush and Obama administrations would be hell-bent on not allowing these statistics and these facts to go out to the people. I thought there spo we're supposed to be an open government. I thought we should be allowed to know what the cost of war is, not be subjected to this type of uh, cover-up. You know, war is man at its lowest degree and lowest level. Nothing good comes out of it, only death and destruction. And so you have a right to know what that death and destruction is. Why do they always try to soft soap it and hide it? Like when they say they're, they're pre precision military strikes to get these people. Yeah, well, their precision usually means a two to, at least a two to one ratio of civilians dying towards military dying. Number two, also leaked by Chelsea was proof of an official policy to ignore torture in Iraq. Fragmentary Order 242 was implemented a year after the invasion. It ordered coalition troops not to investigate allegations of abuse against the Iraqi government. According to medical evidence, here is a list of some of the abuses prisoners endured. Whipping across the feet with heavy cables. Being hung from the ceiling with hooks. Having holes bored into their legs with electric drills. Being urinated upon. And sexual assault. Because of the order, which was a direct violation of the UN Convention Against Torture, no investigations were to take place regarding thousands of reports filed against the Iraqi security forces. Why aren't we allowed to know the truth when war crimes are committed? Torture is a war crime, and the people that advocate it and the people that carry it out are war criminals. And it goes to the highest echelons, because if you okay it, that makes you a war criminal. If you have knowledge and don't report it, that makes you a war criminal. So there are a lot of war criminals out there walking free while Chelsea Manning or Bradley Manning is sitting in jail. And to my knowledge, who did Chelsea Manning torture to get in jail? Nobody. And finally, since December of 2009, President Obama has authorized a secret drone bombing campaign in Yemen. In 2010, WikiLeaks revealed that the president of Yemen said his regime would, quote, continue saying the bombs are ours, not yours. 
meaning he would say the bombs were Yemen's, not America's. According to reports, many civilians lost their lives in these drone strikes. One strike alone killed 55 people, 41 of whom were classified as civilians. 21 of those civilians were children. The U.S. military operation in Yemen, which still persists to this day, still hasn't been officially acknowledged by our government. Yeah, you know, there you go. They don't want to make it look like we ever kill a civilian. We only kill the bad guys. Unfortunately, it don't work that way. Why don't we own up to it? It's part of war. It's part of the travesty of war. It's part of the hell of war. And to gloss it over means you're the biggest hypocrite going. And if you don't want to know the truth, then you truly, you're not a vigilant citizen because you need to know the truth and it's up to our government to give us the truth and have an open door policy what exactly goes on in these wars. After all, we pay the bill for them. Remember, we've spent $1.7 trillion on these wars. I think we have a right to know what goes on in them. Governor, was the information leaked by Private Manning classified for our protection and national security as government officials say, or do the leaks provide American citizens with information we should have had access to in the first place? I think it provides us with information we should have access to in the first place. The government uses this national security bullshit to cover up all their wrongdoing. It's time we wake up to the fact, people, and believe me, this hurts to say it, but our government isn't the nice guys you think it is when it comes to foreign policy. We do a lot of bad shit in the world, and yet we're never accountable for everything we do out there. And I can say this because you need to live outside the United States in which to see the United States from a different angle than those of you inside looking out. We got to redirect our foreign policy, and we need to do it quick or we're going to be the most hated country in the world. And I don't like that at all. Chelsea Manning is currently in the process of appealing her conviction, but her legal team is deeply in debt. So she's asking supporters for donations to help her fight for justice. First Look Media's Glenn Greenwald, one of the journalists responsible for exposing the Edward Snowden story, has pledged to double all donations up to $60,000. Jesse, what do you think? Is it time to release Private Chelsea Manning? Yes, I think it is. Absolutely, it is time. Chelsea Manning didn't do anything but show the truth and shine the light on it and be a whistleblower. But in our morally corrupted, upside-down United States of America today, truth-tellers go to jail, liars are made into heroes. How many more times can I say that? And what would you expect? The whole Iraq war was based on what? Lies and we accepted them. Let's turn to our vigilant viewers to see whether they think it's time to release Chelsea. Our Facebook friend Thomas Perry says, there's a difference between a corporate whistleblower and someone who blows the whistle while they're in the military. Not saying they should blindly follow orders, but did she try and let proper authorities know about what was going on before she revealed everything? Good luck on trying to let proper authorities know. Yeah, you can try that, but Here's my answer to a, the military is this. Everyone in the military and everyone who has ever been in the military, we all hold our hand up and we all take an oath. And in that oath, we swear that we will protect the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So when you see the Constitution and the Bill of Rights being violated, you've got to look in the mirror and ask yourself a real bad, hard question. What do I do? if I'm asked to go against what I took an oath to protect. Chelsea Manning protected the Constitution and the Bill of Rights when she did what she did. That took courage. Kanashi Bellard says, despite Bradley's desire to be anything but himself, it's our duty as humans to expose or bring to light incidents of gross misconduct, like a massacre of civilians, including women and children. There's no honor, no valor in murdering the innocent, and there should also be no penalty in exposing it. For people who call themselves civilized, we have failed. I agree wholeheartedly. I can't add nothing to that. We need to expose wrongdoings. We need to expose crimes even when they happen at war, especially for the United States. If we're going to be looked up to, and we're going to be looked at by the rest of the world, we need to be above all that. Because if we're not above all that, we're not going to get the admiration or the support from the rest of the world. And we certainly aren't now. 
The American 15 says Bradley Manning did what most cowards would not do, only because he has a conscience and he's a human being. Well, it took great courage to do what Bradley Manning did, and, and Chelsea Manning now is paying for it. What, 35 years in prison? And I, and I always remember the first thing released was that helicopter and the guys machine gunning innocent civilians down on a street corner. I don't know how many died, 10 to 20 of them. The people shooting those people are free, and Chelsea Manning's in prison. There's the upside down moral compass again, friends. And Chris H. says yes, and gives Snowden the Petraeus deal. Yeah, how come Petraeus, when he revealed things to his lover, to his mistress, how come he didn't go to jail for it, and yet Snowden who isn't in jail but on the run, and Chelsea Bradley Manning are doing 35 years. He should be held to a higher standard. He was a general. And as usual, the officers get off the hook, the enlisted men take the fall. Let's release Chelsea Manning. She's an American hero for being a truth teller. Thank you all for your comments. Keep the conversation going on Facebook or Twitter, and be sure to check Aura.TV to get all the latest episodes of Off the Grid. Until then, stay vigilant and donate to Chelsea's Legal Fund. Okay, Chelsea Manning told about stuff that we're doing all over the world, but there's a real danger right here in our country. Now, remember a while back I played the famous speech now, it's famous by Wesley Clark, who warned us that there were seven countries on the list. This is right after we attacked Iraq. And there were, they listed the seven countries. Well, isn't it strange how one by one we attacked these countries that he named off? And each one was co completely coincidental, right? Well, anyway, now Wesley Clark is warning us about uh, American concentration camps. In fact, he's recommending that people like me, dissidents, who might be radicalized, get sent to it. So here, let's watch this. So you reap what you sow. So how do we fix self-radicalized lone wolves domestically? Well, we've got to identify um, the people who are most likely to be radicalized. We've got to cut this off at the beginning. There are always a certain number of young people who are alienated. They don't get a job, they lost a girlfriend, their family doesn't feel happy here. Mm -hmm. And we can watch the signs of that and there are members of the community who will reach out to those people and bring them back in and encourage them to look at their blessings here. But I do think on a national policy level, we need to look at, um, at what self-radicalization means because we are at war with um, uh, this group of terrorists. They do have an ideology. In World War II, if uh, someone supported Nazi Germany at the expense of the United States, well, we didn't say that was freedom of speech. Uh, we, we put him in a, in a camp. We, they were prisoners of war. So uh, if these people are radicalized and they don't support the United States and they're disloyal to the United States as a matter of principle, fine, that's their right. It's our right and our obligation to segregate them from the normal community for the duration of the conflict. And I think we're going to have to increasingly get tough on this, not only in the United States, but our allied nations like Britain and Germany and France are going to have to look at their domestic law procedures. General Wesley Clark, as always, great to see you, sir. Thanks for your time, and I want to pass it along you, to our Thomas. viewers. Protect your guns with the Safe and Vault store. That's the Safe and Vault store. Click link below right now. A price match guarantee on all of its popular safes. Give them a call today. Free shipping, enter promo code Second Amendment, 2ND Amendment. Found a way, too. As soon as the commercial's over, just put it back. Sorry, that's cable access. I, I blew it. Go ahead and keep playing that when it gets done with the commercial. Yeah, it's... It, it, if it isn't one thing, it's another. We're going to lead into the part about Wesley... Yeah, here we go. Bring up the sound. Honorary medals I've never heard of from around the world made a very outlandish, extreme 
controversial and insane comment yesterday. Oh. I believe it was on MSNBC. Many of you are probably familiar with him. He was very critical of the Bush administration post the September 11th, 2001 terror attacks, of which he accused the Bush administration of going to war in countless country after country, whether or not it was Iraq or Afghanistan overseas, post 9-11, even though the countries, the respective countries like Iraq, had nothing to do with the alleged attacks. Now yesterday on MSNBC, I believe it was, made a comment warning Americans that if they disagreed with the government, they should be put in internment camps. These are some of the most controversial, extreme, anti-American comments I have ever Okay, um, I'm sorry, I just, I had saved that one because it actually puts all the information together in one place, but for cable access, I can't play it because he's just about to cut loose like I do once in a while with a whole stream of uh, expletive deleteds, and we don't have a way of deleting them. But I recommend that you go and look for that Wesley Clark clip yourself. Uh, I'm really organized there, but okay, here's one I can play, and this one is about the Israeli-Palestine issue. And w this is a, a, a fellow that you either like him or you hate him. I happen to like him because he's one of the most intelligent and well-researched scholars on the subject that you'll ever meet, and he tells the truth. Now, I've seen him in a debate with Alan Dershowitz, and Dershowitz is a punk. Uh, he's absolutely, in, I, well, I won't go into that, but Norman Finkelstein, Finkelstein is the one we're talking about, and uh, you can make up your own mind, but listen to this. It's uh, Israel's descent into barbarism. The real news. Welcome to Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. In his book, Method and Madness, Norman Finkelstein wrote, Israel's evolving modus operandi for restoring its deterrence capacity describes a curve steadily regressing into barbarism. Israel gained its victory in 1967 primarily on the battlefield, I'll bet in a, quote, turkey shoot, while in subsequent hostilities, mostly in Lebanon, it sought both to achieve a battlefield victory and to bombard the civilian population into submission. But Israel targeted Gaza to restore its deterrence capacity because it eschewed any of the risks of conventional war. It targeted Gaza because it was largely defenseless. Further down, Norman writes, a supplementary benefit of this deterrence strategy was that it restored Israel's domestic morale. A 2009 internal UN document concluded that the invasion's, quote, one significant achievement, end quote, is, was that it dispelled doubts among Israelis about, quote, their ability and the power of the IDF to issue a blow to its enemies. The use of excessive force proves Israel is the landlord, dot, dot, dot. The pictures of destruction were intended more for Israeli eyes than those of Israel's enemies, eyes starved of revenge and national pride. Near the end of his book, Norman writes, in the Gaza Strip, they, meaning the people of Gaza, preferred to die resisting rather than continue living under an inhuman blockade. The resistance is mostly notional, as the makeshift projectiles cause little damage. So the ultimate question is, do Palestinians have the right to symbolically resist slow death punctuated by periodic massacres, or is it incumbent upon them to lie down and die? Again, joining us in the studio is Norman Finkelstein. Thanks for joining us again, Norman. Thank you so much. So just quickly, again, Norman is one of the foremost scholars of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and as I mentioned, his latest book, Method and Madness, The Hidden Story of Israel's Assaults on Gaza. So talk about this deterrence capacity, uh, the, this, the, the necessity of Israel to prove what it's, the destruction it's capable of wielding. All right, well, Israel, it's a long-standing feature of their security policy, uh, we basically to uh, remind, the Pal remind the neighboring Arab states, Palestinians included, but neighboring Arab states as well, about who's in charge and what are the consequences of uh, challenging Israel. Uh, 
you saw that, for example, in the 1960s. It goes back quite a ways, but I'll um, fast forward to the, 19, the 1967 war. Uh, it was quite clear, and Israel knew it. We know for sure Israel knew it. We knew two things. Number one, that Nasser did not intend to attack on the eve of the Israeli first strike. And number two, even if he did attack, and uh, even if he did it in concert with neighboring Arab states, Jordan and Syria, that the war would be over very quickly. Uh, famously, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, he predicted that the war would last seven to ten days. Uh, and he was always proud of that prediction. In fact, the war was over in, uh, in the first day uh, because Israel, in its first strike, uh, demolished all of the Egyptian planes on the ground, so the war was over. The only reason it lasted seven days is because Israel then proceeded to take land in the Jordan, take land in the Golan Heights. Uh, it wasn't even seven days, it was really one day, and the whole thing was over. Uh, What's the evidence? I, I, what is the evidence so people who haven't followed the story that Israel knew that Egypt wasn't going okay, to Okay, uh, that, that's a good question. Um, the evidence is as follows. The evidence I prefer to, to uh, uh, lean on. There's all sorts of evidence, but I'll use the evidence I prefer to lean on. Most people quote the famous statement by uh, uh, Prime Minister Menachem Begin at the National War College of Israel in July 1982. It was during the Lebanon War. And Menachem Begin uh, had been a member of the National Unity Government that was formed in 1967, so he knew all the inner workings. And he famously said in this um, 19, July 1982 lecture at the National War College. He said, let's be honest with ourselves. Uh, uh, there was no evidence that, uh, that uh, Nasser was going to attack. We decided to attack first. But that to me is, um, that's some evidence. It's not necessarily definitive evidence because Begin at that time was trying to defend his decision to attack Lebanon in June 1982. The internal evidence, which I con consider overwhelmingly um, uh, overwhelmingly uh, supportive of what I'm about to say is um, the Israelis, they desperately needed, in 1967, they needed the U.S. green light because they were afraid if they attacked like they did in 1956 that the U.S. president is going to force them to withdraw, just like Eisenhower forced Israel to withdraw in 1956. So they wanted that American green light so once they attacked, they wouldn't be forced to unilaterally withdraw. And so they were sending all of their officials here uh, to show evidence that we're facing a existential threat from Egypt. Uh, Egypt is going to attack. And so Johnson took all the evidence, uh, Lyndon Johnson, the president at the time, he gave it to like six or seven uh, U.S. security uh, organizations, the equivalent of like, I don't know if it's the same name now, then, but it was like the National Security Council, the CIA, all of the organizations. He asked them, okay, vet the Israeli information, use your own information, what do you come back with? And each time he checked with them, they kept saying, there's no evidence that Egypt is going to attack. And he also, they also said, if there were an attack, and even if it were a concerted attack, uh, it's clear that Israel is going to, in the famous statement, Johnson I was talking to an Israeli official. I think it was Abba Abin, the foreign minister, but I can't say for sure. And he says that all our intelligence shows us, number one, Egypt is not going to attack. And number two, if they do, and Johnson's famous line was, you're going to whip the hell out of them. Now, you might say, well, that says what the Americans thought. What about what the Israelis thought? It's very interesting. On June 1st, that's just a few days before the Israeli attack, the head of Israeli intelligence, Meyer Amit, he comes to Washington. He's consulting. He's also trying to convince, and he's also trying to sniff out what will the U.S. do if we attack. He meets with the Isra American intelligence, and what does he say? He says, our intelligence agrees with all of your intelligence about whether Nasser will attack and what will happen if he attacks. So there's complete agreement across the board, American intelligence agencies, Israeli intelligence agencies. Nasser is not going to attack. Nasser, even if he did, we will whip, Israelis will whip the hell out of right. them. Which brings us now back to your question. The question is, then why did Israel attack? 
And the response, one of the responses, the one by Ariel Sharon, because there was a split in the cabinet, whether or not Israeli cabinet, whether to launch the first strike. And Sharon said, if we don't, this was Ariel Sharon, it's the same cast of characters, goes back quite a ways. Ariel Sharon, he says, if we don't attack, it's going to diminish our deterrence capacity. What does that mean? Because Nasser was making all of these noises. Nasser did close the Straits of Tehran. Nasser did move troops into the Sinai. Uh, and Nasser, you know, the rhetorical flourishes about we're going to defeat Israel and so on and so forth. And so had whipped up a kind of ecstatic hysteria in the Arab world. Finally, they're challenging Israel. Now, de facto, de facto, Nasser was a windbag. Uh, a congenital problem in the Arab world, um, leaders who are windbags, and obviously there was nothing backing his claims, but they thought that this was whipping up too much of a hysteria in the Arab world. It's time to remind them who's in charge. So then we get That's this term deterrence capacity. Ter deterrence capacity. And incidentally, the, f the expression Turkey shoot, that came from the National Security Advisor, Walt Rastow, and he says, well, yeah, it was a, uh, the Israelis attacked. He said, well, it's more like a turkey shoot, which is what it was. And I should, I should mention, mm -hmm. in, in Method and Madness, the, mm -hmm. all the sources for this are there. So if you mm -hmm. want to know how we know so-and-so said mm -hmm. what they said, check out the book, because it's, it's, it's very, uh, the notations are very detailed. Mm -hmm. um, well, then, uh, and, uh, Yeah, so now to bring it up t to mm -hmm. date, um, to where we begin with Gaza, because the book effectively begins Let's, with... Uh, before you do yeah. that, I want to get to... Deterrence capacity runs into some trouble in a place called Lebanon. That's exactly what I was going to get to. Yeah. That's exactly. We're on the same wavelength. Um, so the book begins with the Israeli attack on Gaza, Operation Cast Lead, in 2008, uh, uh, December 27th, 2008, to July 17, January 17th, 2009. So what was the Israeli purpose behind that? Uh, its deterrence capacity, its ability to frighten, terrify the Arab world, uh, it suffered a real blow during the uh, July-August 2006 war in Lebanon. Uh, Israel went in with the full force uh, of its um, high-tech killing machine, uh, inflicted massive death and destruction. About 1,200 Lebanese were killed. Of those 1,200, about 1,000 were civilians. 200 were Hezbollah fighters. Um, but Israel was very careful not to launch a ground invasion because you don't want to go to war, hand-to-hand -hand combat with the party of God, the Hezbollah. I've met Hezbollah fighters. They're serious, and they want nothing more than to tangle with Israelis. And Israeli soldiers did not want to tangle with the God, party of God. The long and the short of it was Israel, as I say, used this high-tech killing machine for about three weeks' time. Well, it was 34 days, but uh, after uh, about, uh, okay, let's call it four weeks' time. Uh, and uh, then it was clear that the only option now was to launch the ground invasion because the Hezbollah had these... Um, what year are we in? Uh, 2006. Uh, Hezbollah, Israel claims it knocked out the medium and long-term missiles. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but it's for argument's sake accepted. The problem was these sh short-range rockets that Hezbollah had. You can't disable them from the air. The only way you can disable them was with a ground invasion. And Hezbollah kept firing more and more and more, not inflicting massive damage, but showing it's still resisting. The only way to get rid of them is, as I said, through a ground invasion. Israel did not want a ground invasion because it knew it would suffer significant combatant casualties. And so Condoleezza Rice in the uh, UN was blocking any resolution ending the conflict. But then it was clear we better end this now because we're in a mess. And so Condoleezza Rice finally uh, allowed the resolution to pass in the Security Council and the uh, Lebanon so-called, uh, what well, was a war in some ways, was over. It was horrible what the Israelis did at the end. It's all completely forgotten. The resolution was passed. The war was over. 
all that was waiting was now implementation on the ground. Everybody agreed, war is over. What did Israel do in the last 72 hours? It's all completely uh, eliminated from the historical record. It dropped four million, four million cluster bomblets on South Lebanon, saturated the whole of South Lebanon. It was like a science fiction movie. If how, you do, read, how do we know this? Oh, you just look at um, um, uh, the Human Rights Watch report. Uh, on South, it was called Flooding South Lebanon. Uh, it's a very vivid depiction of the monstrousness of what Israel did. It depicts homes, the roofs, through the windows, the cluster bomblets, and their entire apartments are just saturated with them. Four million cluster bomblets. In any case, that's a separate issue we maybe one day I'll come back and talk about. But for now, the point is uh, Nasrallah kept referring to it as our divine Nez victory. Nasrallah, leader of the Hezbollah. Uh, yeah, the head of the Hezbollah, Sayyid Nasrallah, kept referring to it as our divine victory. And that, of course, shook up the Israelis because it was like Nasser, but with a real victory. And it was time they had to figure out a way to restore their deterrence capacity. And they chose Gaza. And in the typical cowardly way, they chose a place which was utterly defenseless. Uh, and then proceed to uh, prove how tough they are. Uh, prove how tough they are against a <laughs> defenseless victim. Uh, in Operation Cast led about uh, 1,400 Palestinians were this killed. 2009. 2008, nine, mm. uh, of whom about uh, up to 1,200 were civilians. They left behind uh, 600,000 tons of rubble, uh, which is actually. Uh, it paled in comparison to what they did during Operation uh, the, uh, Protective Edge this past summer. Protective Edge was much worse, uh, but it also was different because uh, the Palestinians did manage to produce, uh, to build uh, the tunnel system. And because of the tunnel system, uh, they were able, the tunnel system was, the tunnels were not vulnerable to artillery strikes or air attacks. They were pretty impressive. Uh, anyone who knows the Arab world knows every, uh, four out of every three, pal every three Palestinians is a civil engineer. And in Gaza, you have a lot of unemployed civil engineers. And so with very primitive um, implements, they actually built a very impressive, uh, sophisticated, a catacombs tunnel system in Gaza. And so when Israel went in, it never went very far in. There's a misunderstanding about that. They basically stayed on the border because the Palestinians were coming, were coming out, the, Hez, the Hamas fighters were coming out of the tunnels. And there was, it's not Stalingrad, it's not Leningrad, but uh, in the first operation cast led uh, ten Israeli combatants were killed. Of those ten, four of the ten were killed from friendly fire, which means only six were actually killed uh, by his Hamas fighters. This time it was different. It was 67 Israeli combatants who were killed. And they were basically killed for two reasons. First of all, the Hamas fighters appear to have been more sophisticated this time. It's said they were trained by Hezbollah, but I don't know. But secondly, it was that tunnel system. But your main, your main point here is, mm -hmm. is, is that the fundamental reasons for attacking Gaza is to sort of reassert the fear factor. A fear factor, but there was also a, a second factor, which I discuss at equal length, which is the peace offensive, that every time Hamas was becoming too respectable, every time Hamas was becoming too reasonable, every time Hamas was upholding the terms of the ceasefire that it signed with Israel, there was the fear by Israel that somebody will say, well, if they're respecting agreements, if they're carrying on in a responsible fashion, then why don't you negotiate with them? And the Israelis have a nice, or one Israeli political scientist, his name is Avner Yaniv, he quoted a nice expression, uh, he coined a nice expression, he called it the fear of Palestinian peace offensives. They're becoming too reasonable. And so we have to hit them hard so that the quote-unquote radical and extremist elements will gain the upper hand internally. Uh, so every time there's a Palestinian peace offensive, 
uh, Israel uh, launches one of its um, uh, and, murderous inv and, invasions. And, and, and that's and the, exactly and, and, the, and the sort of, I guess, one of the nightmares of the Israelis in terms of all this is, is a, some reunification with Hamas and Fatah and the PLO. And that's exactly what happened. They, had, they created this unity government. Right, and that's actually how, that's the proper starting point for what happened in Gaza this past summer. It was what's called the Government of National Consensus that was formed at the end of April uh, 2014. And um, surprisingly, the United States and the European Union, they did not immediately break off relations with the new government because technically Hamas is, you know, uh, has a terrorist organization in the U.S., a terrorist organization in the EU. So you would have expected the U.S. would break off relations, and the EU would, but they did not. Part of it, I think, it was punishment because of the Kerry Peace Initiative, which was sabotaged by Netanyahu, and they wanted to get even with him for that. So they said, no, we'll take a wait-and-see approach with the Hamas government. And this inflamed and incensed uh, uh, Netanyahu because this is the second time these countries are dealing with terrorists. The first, of course, is Iran. They're in the midst of these negotiations with this government that's threatening a second holocaust against Israel and all that sort of nonsense. And now they're negotiating with Hamas, which, you know, wants to destroy Israel. Uh, but all um, uh, Netanyahu could do was fume. He didn't really, he wasn't able to do anything about it until, <coughs> excuse me, in June of this past year, uh, when the three kidnappings occurred of the Israeli teenagers, he found his opportunity. Uh, he decided to use that as a pretext. He knew the kids were killed, were dead almost within 24 hours. He knew all so that. So he didn't have to go looking for them. Yeah, and yeah. it was also known almost right away that Hamas leadership were not in exactly. on Exactly. So. He knew all that. And, but they used it as a pretext to launch what they called Operation. In your book, you call it a gift. It's a yeah, they, they are gifts. But these are politicians. You know, sometimes people feel like when you say expression like gift, that's just a little bit too callous. They're politicians. After 9-11, yes, Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, Cheney, they got in their little office, they shed their salty tears, and then 15 minutes later they said, now, what are we going to do with it? Now let's get down to serious business. We're not here to cry. And it's the same thing with Israel. Okay, three kids are killed. We're not happy about that. Now, what can we do with it? Uh, and so he launches Operation Brothers Keeper, goes on the, uh, Israeli troops go on the rampage in the West Bank, uh, kill Palestinians, demolish Palestinian homes, um, arrest 500 militants from Hamas, knowing full well that this is going to evoke uh, a violent reaction from Hamas, and then when they get that violent reaction, they can say exactly... Violent reaction meaning some uh, rockets that ro basically rockets, don't hit very much. Right, or some crazy thing, whatever is going to happen. And then Netanyahu can say, as he did say a few, month, a few weeks later, he said, quote, never second guess me again on Hamas. When I say they're a terrorist organization, they're a terrorist organization. Now he had his proof. Uh, and so... Uh, he exploited the opportunity. Because as long as he can keep Hamas as a terrorist organization out of the talks, any possibility of any res uh, reconciliation or deal is off the table. Right, because he then says the Palestinian Authority doesn't represent all Palestinians. So how can we negotiate a deal with them? Uh, the whole purpose is... It's and, and he comes to Congress and they stand up 27 times or whatever the crazy number of standing ovations was. Mm -hmm. But now he... I think he went a little too far with the last visit to Congress. Okay, we're going to talk about mm -hmm. that and where we're at in the next segment. Mm -hmm. Please join us for a continuation of our discussion with Norman Finkelstein on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. Okay, that's a, a good one. Actually, there's two more parts. There. Anyway, uh, back to the United States. Uh, we have a problem virtually everywhere, and I can kind of give you an example of what I'm talking about uh, using the Portland metropolitan area as a kind of a guideline. Think about the police when they go to Beaverton or Gresham. They're on patrol. They're actually patrolling. When they go to northeast Portland, they're hunting. Okay? Now, if you don't understand the difference, well... Um, 
let's just put it this way. You take that attitude and compound it with the thin blue line that, you know, keeps the cops silent when they see other cops doing wrongdoing, and then compound that with a culture of lying. Well, sometimes you get caught, though. Here we have a, a great story. Well, it's not that great, but I mean, it started out bad, but it, the cop got exposed. So let's watch this. This is a good one. Welcome to the advice show, Medio, the Common Sense Approach. So we have another police incident involving more black people once again at the, and being on the receiving end of police brutality. But we're going to look at what the Denton Police Department put out for the public. And then we're going to look at to see if that match the video that we're going to look at. But let's look at the uh, report that they put out. So we put it up on the screen and it says officers were dispatched to 700 Fort Worth Drive, Motel 6, in reference to an indecent exposure call. The caller stated that there were was a naked female carrying a baby in the back lot of the complex. Upon arrival, the officers found the female on the second floor balcony wrapped in a blanket and the baby in the arms of an unknown male. Officers tried to take the female to find out what was going on and determine that she was in an altered mental state. Due to her altered mental state, the officers felt she needed to be medically evaluated. The officers decided to place her in handcuffs for her safety and the safety of others until she could be checked out by medical personnel. While trying to do so, the female started to resist the officers. While the two officers tried to gain control of the female to get her in handcuffs, the male that was holding the baby turned and handed the baby to another person and tried to interfere with the officers. The third officer on the scene acted as a blocker between the male and the officers and the female. That officer told the male multiple times to get back. The male ignored the officer's orders and tried to push his way past the officer to get to the officers and female on the ground. When the male tried to get past the officer, he deployed his taser, bring the male to the ground. Once the situation was under control and the female was being loaded onto a stretcher to be taken to a local hospital for evaluation, a three-year-old male came out of their motel room naked and wet. Officers went into the room and found that the shower water was on and was also scalding hot. Officers had the Denton Fire Department medics check out both the baby and the three-year-old and determined that neither was injured. The male, later identified as Marcus Coleman, 26 years old, was arrested for interfering with public duties. Okay, so we read what they put out. Now, let's go ahead and roll the clip. <laughs> Do you see a problem with the videotape versus what we read, correct? What was the problem? The problem is on that statement that they put out stated that this guy was trying to get past a cop that had a taser on him. Now, that didn't look like what we read. It looked like the guy was just saying, hey, she's crying for help. Help her. We're human beings. Why are you doing this sort of thing? And because the guy got loud, they want to tase him. But put it on the report that he tried to get past the cop. You see how they lie on us all the time? Why didn't you put on a report? He got loud. I don't like when black people raise their voice at me because I get scared when black people raise their voice at me. Because when they raise their voice, I get, you know, so worried they, they're going to turn into an incredible Hulk or something because, you know, black people raise their voice. I don't know what is it about black people's voice to strike fear in them. You know, it's like it's amazing to me how our voices just, you know, 
carry in a way that they are so afraid of us, of us speaking, speaking. But if it was another white person talking crazy to them, they ain't not afraid of them, but only afraid of us. It is that amazing? And yet every single time they're in fear of their life. You see, y'all lucky I ain't got the ability to, to revoke all that stuff. Because all this fear of my life stuff, if you're that afraid, you shouldn't be in that position, first and foremost. Number two, I don't like that interpretation, fear of my life, because that's personal interpretation. You know, all of us around here can be in fear of our life about things. But do we have a right to kill people, kill anything we want because we're in fear of our life? You get what I'm stating? But this is what happens to black people in the interaction with police you see this stuff all the doggone time and once again what do we state on the sandra bland video who is the culprit being a part of this a white male cop notice that and i'm gonna keep bringing that up every time i see these videos because it is the pattern it's not the norm. You don't see. I promise you, if it was a bunch of black male police officers doing the exact same thing to white um, females and white males, they would bring it up all over the news. It'd be everything. What's the epidemic with black cops always terrorizing white uh, people? It, it, you know they would bring that junk up. So don't come to me telling me nothing about it. That's racist to bring that. How is it racist? It's just a fact. And like I told y'all, don't even bring that term of racist to me. You don't know what the hell you're talking about when you use the word racist. Now, this video is just sickening. And this video has been shared a lot all over Twitter and it's spreading around on Facebook. But it's just how we are treated as black people. We can't tell you that, listen, this woman need help. A black man trying to defend a black woman and you get tased for it because we just acting aggressive. And then you put on a report that we are trying to get past you. You know, Sandra Bland, she did all this stuff to me, but yet we seen the tape. And that woman didn't do anything to you. You know, a lot of people was talking about, you know, today that, you know, Dylan Roof killed nine people. And look how he's treated. But you see how black people are treated. They don't kill nobody. He's just voicing your opinion. See, when I'm putting out these stories and I'm talking about this stuff, these are the experiences of black people in America. And we're going to keep talking about our experiences and keep putting it out there on the forefront because we have to. We can't allow this stuff to get swept underneath the rug. And we can't allow these people to try to tell us that we shouldn't talk about this and, and we shouldn't mention this and let it go away and all this other stuff that these people like to tell us. We have a right to put our stories out and say how we feel about being treated this way based upon stereotypes based upon uh someone who got a power trip and we all know that the ku klux klan has infiltrated police departments we know this sort of thing so this is why when we see these things are we really surprised to see if anytime a black person got something to say something happens to them look at sandra bland she has something to say about her rights and look what happened to her so they treat us like we still on the plantation field you don't speak up that way against massa the overseer the officer oh you see how that word blends together this this is how we are treated i tell people all the time you better understand there's a different america for black people you know when they when they wrote that those laws and everything they ain't write it for you and me that's why they don't treat us equal to them when we do on certain things and we got to call this stuff out and keep putting it in their faces and say listen this is the way you treat us you don't treat us the same. You treat a dog better than you treat us. A dog got more rights in America. Shoot, people will cry over a dog getting killed versus a black person getting killed. They'll justify it. They'll justify this video. You know, it's always something they doing right. I never hear say, you know what, they're wrong and they should be uh, dealt with. But we're going to keep putting out these stories as we get them because this video is not right just because he's saying listen the way this woman is screaming i just you know help her and yes you hear somebody screaming like that you're going to raise your voice but once again it's a black person unless we're timid and fearful then we are a threat and you got to shoot them or taste them it is the woes of dealing with things in this country as a black person it just is. And when you are so far removed from it as a black person, think it won't happen to you. You better be, trust me. It could happen to any one of us at any given time.
Keep your eyes open. Know it when you deal with these police. You know, you're dealing with someone that could potentially kill you for anything. You know, a mere traffic stop can get a bullet in your head. Hit me up in the comments, future commentaries. Subscribe. Yeah, now don't use the police to resolve your conflicts. They're not mediators. They're not there to help you. They're there to make a bust. And they don't care whether they bust you or the other guy or both of you. And they don't care if they kill you to do it. So you don't call somebody when your neighbor's music is too loud. You don't call the cops. Because you might just be starting a situation that leads to somebody's death. Now, some of you white folks out there say, well, I'm a white guy. Why am I saying this stuff? Well, I started out naive. I'm probably still plenty naive. But I'll give you an example. About 20 years ago, 15 years ago, about maybe, one of my black friends came over to my house, and I had just gotten a brand new radio. And, you know, he was just as thrilled as I was, and and he wanted to see it, and he asked me if he could use it sometime, and I said, sure, and I grabbed a bag and stuffed the stuff in it, the wires, the antennas, stuff, all, you know, all the connections and whatnot, and, and I, start, I handed it to him just as he was leaving the house, and I was surprised as hell about his reaction. I couldn't understand it. He, he pulled back from it like this, ah, like it was hot, like it was, you know, a burning ember, and I, I said, what? It was, you know, quarter to 11 at night. Now, I think nothing about going to the store at 11 at night or walking home or doing anything. I just do it without a problem. But a black person, I didn't even think about this. He says, a black man can't walk through the neighborhood carrying a bag at night. I said, what do you mean? He says, it's going to take me an hour and a half or two hours to get home if I do that. And he only lived like five blocks from me. I said, what are you talking about? He says, by the time the cops ask me what I got in the bag and where I'm going and where I came from and why do I have the bag and all this sort of stuff, it gets down to the point they might even take him in, whatever. And then, he, then they set him free. You know, so you looked like the guy we were looking for. You know, some phony-ass lie. Remember, the cops are hunting in this neighborhood. Anyway, how would you like to have to think about that type of thing, whether you carry a bag in the neighborhood, a, just a paper bag? You have a right to carry a paper bag, like you came from the store, and it's nobody's business who you, know, who you are. It's nobody's business where you came from. It's nobody's business where you're going, and it's nobody's business why you have a bag. But it happened. Okay, well, anyway, time is getting short. We're going to play one last clip. Remember hearing about the... Uh, Hastings vehicle crash that was so mysterious the engine got ejected 90 degrees after it blew off the road you know it's obviously an execution and the, it was alleged that cars could be hacked remotely well yes they can and here's the story about the proof Welcome back, friends. Welcome back to the Corbett Report. Yes, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, back from summer hiatus. Thank you for your patience during my holiday, and specifically, thank you to all of those CorbettReport.com members who have participated in the Greek drama Open Thread that I left on the website just before I went away on vacation. Uh, I did leave it open for discussion, and thankfully there was a very lively discussion with hundreds of links and, uh, d and discussion on all sorts of different subjects, not just the Greek crisis, but all sorts of other unfolding news events while I was away. Thank you to each and every Corbett Report member who did leave their comments and uh, discussion there. I hope people will check that out. But we are back from vacation. We are ready to roll up our sleeves and get right back into it. So let's do so with yet another conspiracy theory confirmed, namely that crazy kooky conspiracy theory that people can remotely control your car and kill you. Well, there was an experiment of sorts that was recently performed by Wired that proved just that. Hackers remotely kill a Jeep on the highway with me in it. This is a first-person account of just such an event that starts by saying, I was driving 70 miles per hour on the edge of downtown St. Louis when the exploit began to take hold. Though I hadn't touched the dashboard, the vents in the Jeep Cherokee started blasting cold air at the maximum setting, chilling the sweat on my back through the in-seat climate control system. Next, the radio switched to the local hip-hop station and began blasting 
ski low at full volume. I spun the control knob left and hit the power button to no avail. Then the windshield wipers turned on and wiper fluid blurred the glass. As I tried to cope with all of this, a picture of the two hackers performing these stunts appeared on the car's digital display. Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek wearing their trademark tracksuits. A nice touch, I thought. And this goes on to talk about how everything in this Jeep Cherokee was able to be exploited by these hackers, including its dashboard functions, steering brakes, and transmission, and how ultimately this person was steered off the highway and into a ditch. So, there you go. Uh, Once again, this idea has been around for a few years now and was confirmed by DARPA earlier. Uh, There's a video of that going around. It's uh, certainly been talked about in recent times, but... Here is a really, really mainstream report on the subject. And the interesting thing about this one, well, this was actually done in the past, but in the past it was done with the hackers literally wiring, physically wiring their laptop into the computer's uh, dashboard uh, control system and being literally in the car while doing it. Well, this time they were able to do it from 10 miles away wirelessly uh, by using the, uh, the, the... the Jeep Cherokee's IP address. And if you didn't know that your car in this day and age comes with an IP address, well, welcome to the 21st century and the world of exploits and hacks. But don't worry, because the government is going to save us. Senators Ed Markey and Richard Blumenthal plan to introduce an automotive security bill. So the government is hard at work keeping you safe from those dastardly hackers. Unless, of course, it's the government that we should be worried about in all of this. But no, the government can't possibly be criminals, can they? Of course they can. And of course, this story should bring to mind, to attentive listeners' attention, the crashes of convenience, uh, Michael Hastings. Of course, I did cover this back in episode 274 of the Corbett Report, talking about journalist Michael Hastings and his fiery death uh, in his uh, Mercedes-Benz. And at the time, it was certainly talked about the, uh, the possibility that this was a hack of sorts that took over control of his car and steered him off the road. I discussed that possibility back in episode 274, but crazy kooky conspiracy theory like that, well, not so crazy or kooky anymore. And, well, if we want to get even more grandiose, it's not just cars that are susceptible to this, of course. It's other forms of transportation like airplanes. And so people might want to check out my report, How to Steal an Airplane from 9-11 to MH370 on this very topic, if they haven't done so before. But that's an even bigger fish to fry, as it were. All the links to these reports will be in the show notes, so please do check back and uh, and check into these ideas if you haven't heard of them before, and the fact that they're becoming mainstream ideas at this moment in time. Very interesting. Once again, James Corbett, CorbettReport.com. I'm back at the wheel, and so please do keep checking CorbettReport.com for regular updates, videos, interviews, articles, podcasts. Okay, now, there's lots of people out there that are having lots of trouble and hurting. I ran into a lady today with two small children from Tacoma. She's homeless, and somebody stole her food stamp card. So reach out and help somebody, and I'll see you next week.